What's up, everybody? Garrett back here from Morty Rad, a.k.a. The Rad Influence. And I'm Mel from My Killer Podcast, a.k.a. The Rad Hatter. And I'm your host, Justin, from Movie Watch Daily, a.k.a. The Dead Couch. And together, we are The Rad Pack. All right, guys, so we have something really special for you. If you've been following us on social media, on Instagram, on YouTube, we've been talking about a movie that we saw at Panic Fest called Bury the Bride, which just debuted this weekend on Tubi. How excited are you guys right now? Super I am, excited. I can't wait for this. I'm excited. I'm nervous. Yeah, so we have Spider One, the director and writer of Bury Your Bride, coming on the Rad Pack podcast today to talk all about that movie. Again, we are going to go into no spoilers because we explained that that's probably the best way to watch it. But Spider is here right now to talk about Bury the Bride. So we're going to bring in Spider now. All right, guys, we are here with Spider One. We're lucky to have him here on the Rad Pack podcast. Now, welcome to the Rad Pack podcast, Spider. Welcome. Now, before we get started here, I just have a story that I want to kind of set the tone here with uh, okay. for you. Um, I'm bringing it back to 19, I'm going to say either 97 or 98. Okay. Um, Providence, Rhode Island, I was about 30 feet from the stage on the left. And you, Power Man 5000 opened for Primus. And it was probably like one of my first concerts, like as a, as a young preteen uh, and it was the first time I ever seen Power Man 5000. And you guys opened for Primus in Providence, Rhode Island at the Strand. I don't know if you have any recollection of that. Of course I do. Yeah, but that was I, that was 97. I believe it may have, maybe it bled over into 98. Um, yeah, opening for Primus on the, I think the album they were promoting is called the Brown Album, which is it was. title. It was. <laughs> the first leg of the, the funny thing about that tour, it was a great tour. Uh, but the the funny thing about that tour was the first leg of the tour, the the, the band before us was this band called Bucko Nine, which was like a oh yeah Scott band. band oh yeah yeah yeah. For but sure. then the second half of the tour, this this at the time unknown band that was was going to open the show, this little band called Limp Biscuit that no oh, one sure. oh yeah, <laughs> and uh, we're like who the fuck is this Limp Biscuit? <laughs> And they wow. came on the tour. Nobody knew them, but by about halfway through, they had blown up and been, and they were just massive, and they should have been headlining the tour. And like, they went from being, I've never seen anything happen so fast, from going to, you know, from complete unknowns to like hugely famous. Great that is wild. And I'm trying to think if Bucko Nine maybe opened for you guys. I, they may have. It was so long ago, yeah. but I do remember you guys coming on, and it was kind of my first introduction to you, and. uh I ended up picking this bad boy up right there at the merch yeah. stand. There and uh, so um, I remember it was like, what, Tokyo Vigilante was like the main song from that album or whatever. But that was that was my first introduction to you guys was way back in 97. I just thought that was a pretty cool story because full circle. Now you aren't here talking to us about horror movies. Oh, this is pretty damn cool, man. Yeah. Still hanging around all these years. <laughs> later. That was back in the Boston days. I and mean, I grew up in well, I grew up in a town called Haverhill, Mass, which maybe you it's like. Yeah. Massachusetts and moved to Boston and started the band and um yeah we just you know we sort of like became you know pretty popular locally and uh all those songs from those days were all the, the songs we play at the rat skeller and the paradise and tt right. the bears and the, whatever those clubs but i remember a couple other uh providence clubs it was one called the living room oh yeah and oh, the, i've plenty was, of times there oh yeah do you and I don't know if it, it then there was one called Club Babyhead, which I don't know if you remember Baby, that one. Yeah, Club <laughs> Babyhead turned into Club Hell um oh, okay. after a while. Yeah. And then uh we also had Lupos was another one that was really yeah. big. The Met, yeah. the Met Cafe was another one that was really big at the time. Yeah, it's um, been a while. It's been a while since I've been back there, but it was always very cool. Yeah, so that that's awesome, man. But that's not why we're here. Why we're here today yeah. is we we were at Panic Fest. We were lucky enough to see an early screening of your newest movie called Bury the Bride. And that's what we want to kind of talk about here. So before we get started on that, like Panic Fest, man, like how was your experience there and debuting this film in front of everybody kind of for the first time? Yeah, I mean, I love I, we uh, I was lucky enough to be in Panic Fest last year as well with my movie Allegoria. That was the first time I'd ever been to Panic Fest. And, um, you know, there's a million film festivals, you know, but Panic Fest really is a unique and special film festival. I mean, they really do champion independent filmmakers, up and coming filmmakers. I mean, they, you know, they, they showcase bigger movies as well, like Evil Dead Rise and stuff like that. But for the most part, they really are true to supporting newer, 
more unknown films. So uh, I was hooked once we, when we had Allegoria there, it went great. So I knew that, I, you know, they were the first people I called when Barry the Bride was wrapping up. We didn't even finish yet. And I was like, I think we can make it. I think we can get the edit done for, for Panic Fest. And they're like, fuck yeah, let's do it. So, um, you know, I mean, it's, you're, you're playing to such a, you know, enthusiastic crowd because everyone there is, is our, our horror fans. Everyone there are genre fans. Everyone there are film fans and film makers so it's a really supportive vibe so it's nerve-wracking showing your movie in front of in a in a theater in front of strangers but <laughs> you know that you're sort of in good hands there you know unlike once it, you put it out to the world that's when people get you know brutal you know <laughs> where i live in kansas city that's where screenland is um yeah uh it's it's a very unique independent theater i'm so glad that we still have these kind of independent theaters hanging out and um adam the uh director of panic fest and his partner put on such a such a cool thing is panic fest a lot different than other film fests that you've been to as far as like you're kind of just in the mix and in the thick of all the fans and it's kind of chaotic uh what was going through your head when you sat down there and uh, you know you had your cast and crew there it must have been a pretty pretty unique experience yeah i mean it is i mean i haven't been to a ton of film festivals but i know this one absolutely is unique and i and i know what you mean by the fact that everybody's just kind of chilling together and it's not like you know yeah you're just in with the crowd and and that's what makes it fun you know and that's what makes it cool that you can just have a conversation with whoever about the movie and um um it's it's a little i was more nervous with allegoria because i'd never you know shown a movie in in front of people before you know so that yeah. was that yeah. was a joke like i could play a show and you know play some festival in front of hundred thousand people in europe and not even like break a sweat or be nervous <laughs> but playing a movie in front of 100 people I'm like holy shit like this is fucking scary you know but um yeah it was okay. a little more relaxed this time so I'm like okay i've done this before i'm not going to die there everyone's going to be cool so uh <laughs> you know it was uh it, cool. it is a, a very specific group of people that come to that theater and Panic Fest that are there for horror. So it's not like you're going to a, a, a film fest where it's going to be tons of different genres that may be turned off by a really gnarly horror movie like Allegoria or Bury the Bride. These people are here for blood and carnage. And yeah. holy shit, did you deliver <laughs> every, uh. above and beyond for Bury the Bride? I mean, holy shit, what an experience. You threw everybody in that audience for a loop now obviously this is a kind of movie you really you don't want to talk too much about the plot details because there's a lot of yeah. surprises and a lot of reveals that happen that took us all by surprise um but uh the movie is is amazing the performances oh, the the fact that you guys threw this movie not threw it together but were able to complete it in what six or seven days is just mind blowing to me. Where you can do it like it, yeah. eighteen hour days or how did they how did that happen? It, yeah, I mean it really was. Um, it was seven days and and basically oh, all, all all night shoots. So no one sleep. You know, I would um, me and Chrissy would we had how we we filmed it out in Lancaster, California, in the desert, and we had a couple of Airbnb houses for cast and crew, but we we would drive home every night. So we would shoot and I'd be the first one there and the last one to leave. And by the time I got home, it, the sun would be up and then I have to be back, you know, in a few hours. So I would just be, I was wrecked by, I mean, we were shooting at, uh, you know, I think an average film, maybe you shoot like three or four pages a day. We were doing 12 and a half pages a day. It just, Christ. I mean, it's, I'm not really proud of it. I'm never going to do that again. It's like, fuck that. Like, it was insanity, you know, to try to accomplish that much. Um, and we had everything going against us. I mean, I talked about the weather and, uh, you know, just the elements and the hostile environment. And, and there are a lot of characters. For a small movie, having nine characters is, is a lot to uh, to cover, you know. Mm -hmm. So it just, there were, t there were tons of challenges. And by, the, by night six, I... There was one moment where it was a scene. I remember very distinctly the scene where Liz gets killed in the truck and it wasn't working. And I, and it was just like three in the morning. We still have like four pages to go on. And I almost was like, I can't oh, do this, man. <laughs> I'm going to lay on the floor and let the rattlesnakes bite me. And I'm going <laughs> to but we did it. We fought, we fought through. We finished. Well, dude, it. and also it was all it was all practical effects. So if you yeah. throw a bunch of fucking blood on somebody, it's not like CGI. You have to reset. So if you don't nail those type of effects shots on the first or second take, I mean, you can blow a whole night. 
on an effect yeah. shot, right? Yeah, we didn't want to do any uh, digital stuff. So it just, uh, yeah, you're right. Like there was, a, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a scene where somebody gets shot in the head and it's like, you know, you're going to, you're going to blast, a, you know, a gallon of blood on the wall. And it's like, if you don't make that shot, you're oh. going to spend an hour cleaning up and resetting. And so that gets nerve wracking because, you know, mm -hmm. you don't have time for mistakes. And luckily we had a, a lot of talented people uh, working with us and, and honestly, like the cast, had I not had those group of actors, I don't know if this would have been possible. I mean, everyone came 100% prepared and, you know, we're just great. So in, in down for whatever, you know, um, you know, there was, we, we asked a lot of people, you know, to be out in the elements, freezing cold, covered in blood, laying in the dirt with like yeah. the rattlesnakes and rattlesnakes and spiders and, we did some other thing, you know, scout. I mean, at this point, I mean, there's one point we buried her in the ground and she was fine with that. You know, we did a lot of crazy shit and everybody was just down for it. So that I would feel really fortunate we had. That I actually had a question kind of pertaining to the cast. Like um, the movie centers around a group of girls going to a bachelor bachelorette party for a weekend. Um, and obviously chaos ensues. But the chemistry between all of these actors it, it felt extremely natural. Like I, I bought that these guys, these ladies had known each other. Did this group of actors, they met before? Or did you guys get like a lot of rehearsal time? Cause the chemistry was fucking awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, on it, we had worked with, I had worked with ev almost everybody before. So I've known Scout. I met Scout when she was like 19 on the set of Halloween too, you know, so no, mm -hmm. known her forever. Chrissy, of course I live with, we have a kid together. So I know her <laughs> and, uh, um, Adam Mark Markinowski, who plays Mike, he was in Allegoria. Uh, Lindsay was in Allegoria. Rachel was in Ad Allegoria. So there's like a, a family vibe. And, and you know, we've, we've become good friends with Chaz. And he knew Dylan and Cameron. So everybody in some regard, the only person we had never worked with or knew was Katie, who played Betty. Um, and it was the last role we cast. We couldn't find the right person. We just... Was, I don't know what it was. We just, we, we saw a million tapes and we finally got Katie's tape. And we're like, that's Betty. So we found her and she fit right in. So it really was like a group of friends. And um, that definitely helpful too, because everybody was like, loved each other. And, you know, between takes, I'd be trying to find them and they'd all be in the trailer, like having a fucking dance party. Like, yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. So, very cool. Uh, um, there was actually, speaking of Allegoria, I actually had a, a question. I hope you don't mind me quoting you. I know that seems a little strange, but I watched Allegoria again today, and there was a particular line that stood out to me, and it kind of just made me think about your first two movies and your career moving forward. Um, I, I love this line. At the beginning of the movie, there's a character who says, um, others see what is and ask why. I see what could be and ask why not. Yeah. And when I watched Allegoria, which is amazing, it's such a cool movie, such a oh, cool man. movie. You, it was kind of a, per a perfect debut, I imagine, for you, because being that it's kind of an anthology film that's threaded together with a connecting story, you were able to kind of tell a bunch of different stories within the same movie. And the whole movie is has that theme of kind of just ripping your heart out for your art and uh, being original and honest. And the second movie, Bury the Bride, that you did is a complete uh, depart, not it still has all the horror elements and stuff, but it's, it's very different from Allegoria moving forward. Yeah. And with your, with your films, is it going to be important to you moving forward to kind of reinvent and try different genres and completely different stories? Are you wanting to be completely different with every film or is it just kind of, that's just how it's coming out for you? Yeah. I mean, I think that you, it, you know, you don't intentionally just try to, you know, be incredibly different every time, but it's not unlike being in a band, you know, it's like, you have to, you know, I'm not the same person I was when I released mega Kung Fu radio in 1997. So you know, you're going to like evolve and change, but there's always some core that remains in there. Like I hope if I make it and, you know, lucky enough to make a bunch of movies that you can tell like, Oh, that's probably a spider one movie, even though they may be very different subject matter or tone or in, environmental things will be different. But, you know, and I feel like I'm still finding my voice in that world. It's very, you know, it's still pretty new to me. Um, Allegoria for me was like a really fun one because it just felt super personal, you know, because it is, you know, on a, in a heightened sense, taking these kind of ridiculous characters and their obsessions and, you know, sort of their pretentiousness and all mm -hmm. this stuff. But 
but it really did like there is some truth to all that in my life just this idea of trying to survive as a creative person and you're you're constantly doubting yourself you're constantly trying to have to inspire yourself you're constantly one day you think you're brilliant the next day you think you're a fraud you know it just you go through all this roller coaster so that movie for me was you know i still you know that i mean allegoria and both bury the bride are kind of like my indie punk rock records you know what i mean like and i hope that the next one i think you know it's like let's get in a real studio and make a real record you know i feel like yeah. that's going to be the next one we're going to try to step up um a couple notches and do something you know like with bury the bride i mean there was there was no time to experiment or take sometimes we only had time for one or two takes so mm. the next the next movie which we're shooting in june we're gonna like we're taking some more time with it and uh i think I, I just, I hope that this one will be the one that's like, okay, there it is. Like, there's the, this is what it's all kind of leading to. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How the hell are you balancing? Because you you start tour again. You're on a little break right now. You start in May, right? Yeah, no, I'm an idiot. I just never. How the hell that. are you going to do it? <laughs> How the hell do you I don't know. I days? honestly don't know. We got back from tour and I don't remember what, I went to, Australia. I don't remember. Do we shoot Bury the Bride for? I don't even remember. It's like I never stop. So this month, well, I'm going. I have a show at the end of this month in Houston. Then I have one month of prep for the next movie. Wow. Then we shoot in June to July 1st. We wrap, and then I go on tour July 7th. So yeah, not a lot of not a lot of downtime, and wow. trying to finish up a new record in the in the meantime. So you know. I keep telling myself, like, at some point I will take a break, but it hasn't <laughs> seemed to happen yet. Kind of a sleep when you're dead kind of a thing going on, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of time to make up for, you know. I started this film thing late, so I got to get moving. Well, sure. you're doing a great job with it. I did have actually a question about Bury the Bride. It was such a fun ride, and we all enjoyed it uh, a great deal at Panic Fest. And we're just kind of curious as to how you came up with this idea. To me, this felt like the movie. This felt like... Kind oh, of a cool. blockbuster movie. Nothing about this screamed low budget, small budget, anything. Yeah. I, th I thought it was absolutely great from the casting, the writing, the cinematography. How did you come up with this idea? Yeah, I mean, it was we. I co-wrote it with Chrissy Fox. So I, she actually came up with this sort of the the first germ of the idea and about this bachelorette party and uh, this sister relationship. Because she has two younger sisters and I feel like she's always you know being ultra protective of them and you know well one of her sisters is married and she approves of her husband but her younger sister's dating and it's like she's always very you know suspect of <laughs> who Naturally. her new boyfriend is or whatever you know so i think that there's a lot of that reality in the story that came from from her and her relationship with her her own sisters and that was the uh that was the beginning of the idea but you know it it started out as just kind of like this, these bad guys, you know, um, that show up and there's something not quite right about the fiance. And, and then I was like, ah, oh, we got to take this further. And that's when, I don't know if I want to give it away, but there is a twist and that these guys aren't quite what they appear to be. And I was like, what if we did this? Is this really stupid or is this cool? So we're like, fuck it, let's do it. So we, uh, that's when the movie just takes a total left turn. And I was really happy that apparently no one saw it coming. I didn't know, you know, because obviously living with the movie for so long, you know, you, you just assume that people are going to see that coming. But I've had I've only only heard people that, you know, saying that they did not see the twist coming. So I was really happy. I can assure it. you, none of us saw that no. twist none coming. None of us but saw it. We looked happened, at each other like, what? we loved it. That's yeah. yeah. It, it was a it was kind of a perfect maneuver, I think, because there was a point in time where, you know, even Justin kind of reached over and he's like, you know, he, he's like, I'm not sure where this is going because it just seems very standard. And then all of a sudden when it hit that that left, he looks, he's like, all right, now we're talking like it was just yeah. it was such a good hit. And you could feel funny. that something was coming. I'm like, <laughs> something is going to pop off here. I don't know what the fuck it is, but it's about to get weird. And then, oh, yeah. man, I love I love oh, that. Term. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, you, you you do that kind of move and you hope. Hmm. You know, it's not like, you know, you, you really hope people aren't going to be like, oh, man, I figured that shit out in the first 30 seconds. Like, you know, mm. so we tried to drop subtle hints along the way. But, um, yeah, so I was really happy that that like that worked. So the, I was I was good with the rest of it. You know what I mean? 
Nice. Yeah, we've been trying not to give away the twist at all. So when we're like doing our reviews, we're like, don't watch the trailer. Don't ask anybody about it. Just go watch the movie. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, it's, I know it's out, so I want to talk about it. But then it just came out yesterday officially. So, right. you know, try to keep some surprises. Did yeah. you get to cut the trailer or did Tubi cut the trailer for you? No, uh, we did that ourselves. Yeah. Okay. It was good because that's that, that shows because it didn't give away the entire movie <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the we, trailer. We, we uh, you know, we we went back and forth on how much we wanted to give away because there's a certain aspect of the twist that would make people want to watch the movie. Right. And once That's you give tough. it away, you know, you give it away. It's expected. Mm. Yeah. Like yeah. People will just kind of be waiting for it at that point. Like, okay, when's this stuff going to happen? But yeah, you're right. I think the less people know and the more word of mouth that gets out about just check this thing out, I think it's really going to start to snowball. And, I mean, I don't know if you know, but like, how how has the feedback been these last couple of days? Being, you know, debuting on Tubi. I mean, it, the Tubi thing is so new. I don't, I don't really know, you know. And it's mm. hard to know with streaming. It's just like it's out in a void somewhere. That's why even a chance to show it at one one or two festivals is so meaningful because you get that, you know, you get that immediate reaction from an audience, and the reviews coming from Panic Fest have been all pretty strong across the board. But as far as what, yeah, where this is going to lead and how many people are going to discover it on Tubi, it's hard for me to know at this point. I'm hoping just, uh, you know, it's not like we have some massive marketing budget. So hopefully just word of mouth starts to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, guys like you put, putting out videos, talking about it will snowball and more people will check it out. Well, Tubi's a great destination for horror, just like Allegoria premiered on Shudder, right? That was a Shudder original. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, and Tubi is, I don't know how familiar you were with it before, but it is, it's a super well-known service for people who go to find horror movies. So I think it's actually a perfect fit. Uh, it's free to watch. So you can just pop it right in. You don't have to pay for it. And you can just, uh, it's, I think it's a great home for it. I agree. I mean, Tubi, I, I've been watching Tubi for a while. And you're right. They have an amazing catalog of mm -hmm. film and TV shows and cult classics and in in they in you know in our meetings with them they've said that above and beyond horror is their their most popular genre mm -hmm. on the on the platform so and it's a massive platform mm -hmm. i mean yeah. tubi has more i think tubi if i'm not mistaken has more subscribers than amazon prime like it's, oh wow yeah, i didn't so know it, was it that really true. is a you know whereas the shutter thing which was a, a great experience too i love a shutter is a much more concentrated, curated, right. you know, it's a smaller audience mm -hmm. of horror fans. Um, but Tubi, you know, you're going to reach horror fans and, you know, stay at home moms and I'm excited to see if it translates to a bigger audience. Yeah, Tubi does seem like they're doing it right. They're not asking anything from their viewers, but they want to give to their viewers all of this content. But us three specifically, we're we're collectors. We collect physical media. Uh, what what can we do to get this on physical media so we can put it back there? Because <laughs> we love yeah, this movie I, I so think, much, we kind of want it. You know, I need a Blu-ray. <laughs> I think we will. I think we will do Blu-ray. We have to wait a certain amount of time. And it, I mean, it's in our agreement with uh, Tubi that. Mm. We will yes. have the ability to do that if, even if they decide not to, they are they they'll allow us to do it. So we'll there will, absolutely will be a Blu-ray at some point. I just don't know nice. exactly. That is probably not to like, hear. as fast as most movies. You know, most movies are like out, and the Blu-ray comes out like the week later. But, right. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely. I agree. I mean, I love. I was so excited that Allegorio made it to Blu-ray. And right. It was, it was yeah, awesome. we picked up the Blu-ray of Allegoria because we were like, yes, we need this. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, I can say ninety nine point nine percent sure. That nice, yeah. that's great news. Yeah, like we're we're all big collectors, obviously now. Um, and again, we wanted to talk about this movie more and and even ask you to be on this because it's not we like a lot of the same stuff, but it's not this. It's never like we all really like see something brand new and we're all like, oh, it was awesome. Like, so it's very rare for all of us to be really on the same page yeah. with, a, with a new movie. Um, I could be more guilty than them too when it comes to that, but we just really dug it and wanted to get the word out to make sure like, hey, that this thing is going to maybe see the light of day when it comes to physical media and stuff like that and more people get to check it out. But um, with you, like, are you being involved with music and movies? Like, are you a collector of anything? Do you like like to to collect things or have any kind of hobbies as far as that 
I used to. When I was younger, I, I was definitely into collecting. I mean, ever since a young age, like when I was a kid, I would collect, uh, I collected comic books. So I have a pretty, pretty cool uh, co comic book collection that I've saved since I was like nine, 10 years old. <laughs> so I'm probably worth a lot of money, some, but you know. And then I would collect like action figures. I was I was yeah. big into, and then I and I just heard us hit a certain age. I was like, "What am I going to do with all this?" Stuff? <laughs> As, As you're looking behind us right now, and you're yeah. like, "What are you guys going to do with all that?" Stuff back there? I, would, I would put it in a, in boxes, and then it would stay in the box, and then I'd move, and it would stay in the box, and I'd move again, it would stay in the box. So I was like, "Okay, I'm not buying any more stuff." Every once in a while, I'll find something, or somebody will give me something, or I'll save like instead of having, you know. 800 spider-man figures like i'll have the one that's really cool you know what i mean so um yeah i, I haven't I've, I've sort of given up on my collecting days but i still have a lot of crap hanging around the house and in boxes <laughs> well i say mel will take uh, any extra comic books you have lying around she'll take those off your hands i She's do like, i collect <laughs> comic books as well the crow being one of my favorites so it's interesting to hear that you were collecting comics too <laughs> yeah i was uh uh main mainly marvel stuff um from back in like, I mean, I'm old, older than you guys. So I was buying books in like the seventies and eighties. So I have a ton of Dang. like Avengers and uh, X-Men and Power That's Man, amazing. of course, you know, I have like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. So like, you probably have some of, great stuff. Yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff. They're all boxed and bagged and I've kept, I mean, I've kept them since I was a kid, you know, I remember awesome. I, yeah. So, um, I've never checked the value of them, but I don't want to sell. I don't want to sell. I don't know. They just, they just sit there, but I don't really want to sell them either. Mm, that's the thing about being a collector is like, you know, your stuff is worth so much money, but you didn't collect it to have the money you wanted. You collected it because you love yeah. the stuff. Yeah. I mean, here's, here's the, how I know I'm still have that collector mentality. So when I, when I remember when I stopped collecting comics, I don't know what it was. It was like 10, 11 years old. I'm like, I'm not collecting comics anymore. And I stopped. Right. And so I had other friends who collected them. And they're like, oh, well, can we have, can I buy this one off you? And, I, and so I sold my friends like a few issues of the Avengers. I'd, I'd had this run of the Avengers without missing. Because when I was a kid, my favorite superhero was the Beast. I don't know if you remember the Beast. Oh, yeah. Beast. yeah. yeah. Yep. So I had every issue since the Beast joined the Avengers to whenever I stopped collecting. And so, so anyway, so I sold like three or four issues. And I never forgot it. I was like, fuck, I, still, I don't have those anymore. <laughs> and literally, like, last year, I went on eBay and I found them and I bought them. That's awesome. Them back in the collection. Hell that yeah. Is, yeah. So that is, that. that's a true yeah. collector right there. Yeah, that is a mentality, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're going back and buying childhood toys that we had that were once <laughs> yeah. thrown away. Like, yeah, yeah that, that's that's kind of how it is. But, uh, and you got some cool artwork behind you too, though, man. Oh, yeah, that's some of my stuff. Um, oh, that's awesome. Man. Yeah. Wow. I just do painting whenever I have a chance. I go through phases where I won't paint for like five years, and then I'll paint a bunch of shit and then hang it up. And yeah. That's cool. I like it. Um, and I know you had mentioned that uh, you're going to be starting to film in June. Um, any uh, Anything you can say about your next project? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's a, it's a, um, it's definitely a different vibe than Bury the Bride. It's, um, it's a it's a much more like moodier, darker kind of thing, and it's it's called Little Bites, and it's it's basically sort of based in metaphorically, anyways, based on uh, parenthood and the, this idea that the more you try to protect your children from the world, the more it destroys you, you know, and eats away at you. And so, metaphorically, in the movie, to represent this idea, there is this monster that lives in this woman's house. Um, she's a widow and she has a 10 year old daughter and she's allowing this monster to slowly eat her alive. Oh, what the um, fuck? Because, wow. because she's, trying, yeah, she's trying to keep the monster away from her daughter because ultimately he wants to get to the daughter. Cool. So she feels like she's protecting her daughter by allowing this, this creature who is really smart and they communicate. It's not just like some beast. It's like a intelligent creature um so it's very like it's almost like david lynchy sort of weird vibe yeah so i'm really excited to shoot this one because it's also the as opposed to bury the bride that we we're outside in the desert and you know it's going to be very like inside a house in a very controlled environment 
So production wise, knock on wood should be a little bit easier. I hate to say easy because it's never right. easy, but yeah. <laughs> it'll have its own set of problems. It, will, they all, it always does. Yeah. The things that you think are the easiest to shoot are all, for some reason are the hardest. And then the things you think are going to be really difficult somehow seem to fall together. Mm-hmm. That's my experience anyway. You know, that movie that sounds like sounds, it's going to be right yeah. up our alley. <laughs> that sounds insane. I, yeah, I'm really excited about it because it deals with a bunch of like societal and institutional judgments on on uh, being a parent, and so it, it's but it's all re- represented in this really dark, you know, horrific way. So, I'm, I yeah, that. I'm excited to get started on. on this Is one. this something that could potentially be uh, a Panic Fest 2024 kind of it deal? It seems like uh, it seems like that seems to be my schedule, right? Like, <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> We'd love when to have we, you again, man. When we debuted Allegoria, we started shooting Bury the Bride like ten days later. And wow. so this is almost the same exact schedule, only maybe a month later. So you never know. We'll see. Oh, man. I'd love to do it again. That would be exciting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah for That's sure. awesome, man. But I mean, I just want to thank you, and I'm sure they do as well, like for, for coming on here uh, and chatting with us about it. Because like I said, we really dug it, and we're trying to get people that we talk to to check it out. Because like Justin said, it's free on Tubi. So Bury the Bride is free on Tubi right now. It debuted this week. And uh, we loved it, man. And I, and I want to thank you again for, for being on here with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was an yeah, honor. I, uh, oh yeah. I appreciate you guys. And thanks for the support and spreading the word. And uh, yeah, this was fun. We got to talk about the beast and. Uh, <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. We're just That's a bunch of nerds time. over here. Don't yeah. usually talk about that. <laughs> no, it's going to happen. He's going to message one of us in like three weeks and be like, I'm back to collecting again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. All right. Thanks, it. guys. Hey, yeah, you're welcome, thank man. You thank so you much. so much. We appreciate it. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Take care, man. All right. So that was super cool. Spider One told us a lot of information uh, about the making of Barry the Bride. And guys, like we talked about in there, go check it out on Tubi. It's free right now. Go check it out. Spread the word because we want to get the ball rolling. He did say physical media was a 99% chance. Let's make it a 100% chance. So let's talk about this movie because I find it's a kind of a sleeper. So Mm -hmm. uh, we're all in pretty much agreement with that, right? Mm-hmm. I think so. I think it's a future cult hit to be, I mean, honestly. Yeah, we don't usually agree on everything like that, but we're mm-hmm. pretty much on, on the same page with this one. So guys, make sure to check it out. Our interview with Spider. And again, Spider, thank you so much for coming on here and uh, and chatting with us. That, that meant a lot for us and the podcast. So super cool to talk to you. This is the Rad Pack signing off. And like always, stay rad. Stay weird. And stay killer. 